Well, good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you may be surprised to find this is Martin Stopford welcoming you, not uh, Nicholas, who is on a plane over Europe at 30,000 feet somewhere. He called me this morning to say that he got uh, stuck in Greece and couldn't get back in time for the um, for, for this webinar. Uh, this is webinar four in the series on innovation. And um, to any of you who are what, have watched all the previous three, congratulations. That's, that's really great. <laughs> um, I have to say I'm quite relieved this is the last one. The um, in, in the previous ones, we came to some pretty, I thought, some fairly um, strong conclusions. I mean, the first was that clearly green energy is going to be much more expensive, and that will change the economics of the, what the shipping business is doing. And um, that that investment uh, is going to come in waves. It's not going to come in big chunks. And the waves, I think, what I'm going to add this time is those waves are going to be manipulated by the players as we discover how the technology works. So they're not hard and fast by any means. The waves is just an idea, like sea waves. Then uh, the third thing was that a one size fits all strategy isn't really going to work. The shipping market has far too many um, different segments. I was just looking at the, the cruise segment, for example. Each uh, segment is going to have to figure out its own way forward in this, but we're all using the same sort of building blocks. And then the fourth thing is that the cargo shippers, who on the whole have sat on the other side of the market um, from the owners for the last 20 or 30 years, and it's been quite an adversarial situation, they're going to have to think hard about how they're going to manage uh, their cargo in this era and how they're going to make it possible for ship owners to deal with the quite big economic challenges that lie ahead. So those are the things that I've, I took away from the previous uh, uh, scenarios. And what I'm going to do now is, is to, to um, uh, share my slides with you. And um, you should now be seeing my screen um, with just me as a little uh, postage stamp in the top left-hand corner. And the title of this webinar for is Shipping Company Strategies for innovation. We're going to put aside all the detail and try and look at the big picture and figure out how companies can actually move forwards in this very difficult situation. I'm going to split the session into four bits, as I usually do. Um, the first one looks at the building blocks of change. Uh, I just want to get the basics in place and then move forward um, to simplify the zero carbon options in part two, because I, I just found over the years I've been looking into this, the permutations get more and more complex. And I think if you're going to think constructively, you have to find a way to do that um, uh, that, you know, that actually does really... Um, work in a, in, in a practical sense and the human mind is limited you don't want too many permutations so i'll look at that in part two in part three i've been um, uh, sweating over a hot computer this week updating my model with a new variant on my scenarios it's it, it is hard work because there are so many variables and um so i and i've come up with a couple of slides which are a bit different, and with some and some quite interesting conclusions came out of that. And then finally, because this is all about people, uh, in part four, we'll look at some case studies from pre previous eras of change, just to take a look at what people did, what other people had to put up with, if you like. Well, if we start with building blocks of the change model, um, the, the key issue here really is that, um, you know, the company, at some stage, every company has to get to grips with the basics and figure out what it means for them. And um, this is a little bit of a, a challenge, I would say, because the shipping companies haven't really needed strategic planning all that much in the last 20 or 30 years. It's not something I've ever had to talk about very much. And to be quite honest, if you're focusing on a little bit of arbitrage, playing the cycle, that sort of thing, 
um, you know, who needs strategic planning. You want somebody smart who's got his finger on the pulse of the market. Um, I don't think that's going to be true in the next 10, 20 years. Um, the cycles and asset play will, of course, continue, but the techno-economic change is going to really juggle with the three key variables, economic variables, ship investment, ship operation, and logistics. They're all going to come under pressure as the costs change and the res revenue opportunities change. And so even small shipping companies, I think, are going to have to deal with this. And uh, the final of block, if you like, is the fact that innovation does develop in very different ways. Um, one classic way is e evolution. And this is, of course, good because um, the business develops within the business framework that exists at the current time. It needs to be adapted and changed but uh, 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 modified in some ways, but you don't have to rethink the whole business. And that it, I've got a case study of where you do later on, which is, you know, really makes this point. So evolution isn't an easy life, but it's it's not um, a disaster. Disruptive change is quite um, quite a challenge. And my feeling is that the green fuels thing is reasonably evolutionary. Possibly the nuclear um, is a disruptive force that would need to be thought about. Uh, the, the business model, which we looked at uh, in both of the last webinars, is bristling with stakeholders. When you get to this level, you know, shipping companies aren't working on their own. They're working with, I've got, I think I've got six different lots of stakeholders in this, um, this uh, slide. There's the IMO, there's the flag states, port state control. Uh, we've got the cargo companies, big players, we've got the shipping companies, also big players, uh, bank finance, uh, which is now a much more complex area than it used to be. And um, finally, the shipyards and the equipment manufacturers and guy, people producing onboard um, digital systems. All of these are players in the game and somehow have to work together. Well, that's that's the background. Those are the building blocks. Let's move on to the three options for green energy. It's highly simplified. And the three I came up with as I prepared this session, um, the first is green fuels, obviously. Uh, that sort of covers everything uh, that is a sort of hydrocarbon replacement, uh, all the chemical fuels, if you like. The second one is carbon capture, which I, it sort of grew as I prepared this session. It, it sort of was a bit like Ghostbusters. It sort of expanded and um, I finally ended up as quite a decent sized ghost. And then um, there was nuclear. I'll show you in a minute what I mean. Um, and then there's nuclear power, which, um, you know, could be a very big step forward. But of course, many is is fairly scary for reasons which many people think are unjustified but you know people feel what they feel um if we start with the hydrocarbons i think one of the fundamental truths that it, it deserves thinking about again is that hydrocarbons are a truly wonderful source of concentrated cheap energy and the reason they're cheap and concentrated is that over millions of years that millions of years ago over long periods, photosynthesis collected sunlight, it turned it into biomass that was acted upon by, in um, the earth by pressure, by heat, and it turned into um, hydrocarbons. And the wonderful thing is that they flow out of the ground, uh, you drill a hole, out they come. Initially, they cost almost nothing, you know, they came out under their own pressure, and it's a finished product. Um, and you know, the bad news, of course, as you know, is that you burn your, let's say, methane with uh, oxygen um, and out comes CO2, water and energy. And the CO2, you know, you can't, um, it's going to happen. And so this is 
potentially pushing out a wonderful cheap source of energy and replacing it with this very expensive synthesized energy because the green fuels don't suddenly appear out of the ground. You've got to start where nature um, got started millions of years ago and collect the sunlight, uh, collect the energy from the wind, process it two or three times, transport it in ways that are much harder to transport than the liquid fuels. And that puts you um, in a position where although the green fuels that are available are not that difficult, you're going to burn them in a modified uh, slow speed diesel engine, or at least that's what the engine manufacturers say. And I'm sure they're right. Uh, I think they're a long way down that road now. Um, they're not so efficient. They're not so handy to store. So they, they, uh, some of them need, um, uh, need, need refrigeration. And um, they've got some technical disadvantages as well, which I've been through and won't go through again. Um, that's one set of problems. The other problem shown in this familiar graph is that the supply is slow to grow. And uh, we don't even know how fast this is going to increase. But one, uh, you know, each, this is millions of little projects. And uh, there are many, many issues to be covered, which again, I, we've covered before. And so I won't repeat them. But um, the fact remains that there are heavyweights like the car industry in the queue with for these fuels long, uh, I would have thought with a lot more clout than the shipping industry, and they don't have to bunker it either. So I think you can, you know, my view is you can wait quite a bit before they, um, it's going to be the 2030s before they're available. And I'll show you my scenario in a minute. Carbon capture. I uh, the, the green fuels are a step backwards. I think carbon capture, sort of in a way, is a step sideways. It, you're no better off for it. Um, but um, it is a relatively easy evolution. You've got to find room for it on the ship. It's another load of tin cans, you know. But um, it is, uh, well, as one uh, CEO who I've got a lot of respect for said, it's, it's not a silver bullet, but it's similar to the water ballast, which started out very expensive with many problems, and it slowly, over a number of years, fell into place, and eventually it just becomes routine. And I think that that was um, a, a nice insight. Uh, and I, I um, the, the ships that use carbon capture are going to have to find a home for the uh, the CO two that they capture. But I uh, maybe you can combine that with bunkering. You know, you if I don't know, I haven't really been into this in great depth. But if you turn it um, in into um, uh, um, into ice in, and um, dry ice, uh, then maybe you can pass it on to, uh, to to the same bunker guys that are receipt giving you the fossil fuels you're burning you know it might fix up that way and then they would busy find a market for it there's definitely going to you know I mean, methanol for example great market for co2 so if you can get that really slick might work quite well it's a good fit with lng um because uh, as far as i can see because you know, LNG is already dealing with cryogenics anyway. And um, I'd have thought it might work well with new designs because you can build the ship from scratch or the older designs where you can slow down, generate, um, you, you can find room for the carbon capture uh, and capture equipment and um, you can slow steam to reduce the carbon volume. So, you know, I think this is definitely worth thinking about. Uh, finally, um, nuclear, big step far forward or a step too far. I, I'd say, um, you know, uh, it's gaining ground all the time. I mean, uh, the last year, it's picking up a quite a heavyweight following now. And um, I covered this in quite detail in webinar two, so I won't go over it again. But the molten salt reactors look pretty safe to me. Uh, they come in a size which ships can use. And that is brilliant. You can't, you know, it's not so easy to put a nuclear uh, reactor in a truck, you know. <laughs> so you've immediately got a big advantage. Um, 
And you've got this terrific advantage that, that, that you suddenly have vast quantities of energy at your disposal um, in a way which you're never going to have with the green fuel. So it opens a door there. And uh, so I'm, I'm quite keen on the, on the nuclear. And uh, the, the practical th issue is how do you actually fit all this into place? And that basically is what I have been worrying about this week. Uh, the updated zero carbon scenarios. Uh, and of course, you've got some variables in here. You, can, you can't move very fast with this because, first of all, you've got to wait for the technology to come. And once it's come, you've got to test it. You've got to convince people it works. You've got to order the ship. You've got to wait a couple of years for the ship to arrive. You know, so this is not something that happens overnight. Uh, and the shipbuilding capacity anyway is, you know, five tops 10 percent of world uh, of the world fleet. So it's going to take many years to roll out new ships. And you're going to be looking quite a lot at carbon uh, retrofit, which is an another of the, um, the things to think about. Before I get into my scenarios, just a reminder that information management, whatever you do, the way the regulators are moving, the way business is moving, the way charterers are moving, because they're all getting into I-4, you know, any anybody who hasn't got really good digital technology in the company is going to be a three-stone weakling. Is it a three-stone or a five-stone weakling? I forget, you know, the ones that get sand kicked in their face. Uh, or perhaps you're all too young to remember that. <laughs> there was a chap called Charles Atlas who advertised bodybuilding courses with that um, that particular line. Uh, but anyway, information um, is, is a great protection and it gives you muscle. That's what I'd say, like Charles Atlas would say. Um, the, um, the maritime energy and investment scenario, I start with the shipbuilders. So this is familiar chart it's world shipbuilding deliveries um in million dead weight you know so here's the great 70s bubble and then the 2010 bubble which is still there and here there we've got another bubble ahead of us i mean they do turn up amazingly i spent 20 years trying to predict this and i still got it wrong <laughs> didn't turn up when it was supposed to it, it was a bit later um and um so the, the, the big question here is um, how the shipbuilders are going to cope with it. And I've put in, what I found was that I started out with heavy fuel oil and said, well, look, you know, you can't suddenly drop that. So I've got a bunch of heavy fuel oil, I think with a fair bit of LNG coming in. I mean, the LNG is it's clean in many ways. It's a good discipline. Um, it's getting a bunker network at the moment, and it's cryogenic, which has some advantages. So I, I thought, well, we'll go for LNG. Um, and as you see, we get quite a decent shipbuilding program in the 2030s of ships that are designed for LNG or dual fuel. Um, but when I look at this, and then I looked at the green fuel rollout, and the fact that, you know, I thought, well, maybe by 2030, we might get our hands on a certain amount. You know, there are projects being built for specific companies at the moment. I just, I mean, I just got a um, couple of emails on this uh, b before I came on air. And um, so I think we can expect a fair bit of, um, uh, uh, of green fuel picking up, but not really much growth. I think the fight for that fuel and the price is going to be eye-watering if you have to fight for it. And so I think what I put in, and, and the way I solved that problem, I couldn't, how do we deal with this? And of course, the only solution I could see was carbon capture, which, uh, and so what I've done here is to stick a bunch of the ships, either heavy fuel oil or LNG, which would otherwise um, be dropping into this these categories here by default, because they couldn't get the green fuels. I am sticking them into carbon capture on the principle that the technology, you know, it, it will shake down and with enough money on the table, it will shake down. I mean, it's it's only it's only engineering. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science. So I've, I've got this big 
carbon capture thing. And I think there's lots of room for companies to be innovative in that area, in areas that they're comfortable with, you know. Um, and um, I mean, it's a far better wheeze than uh, sulfur, which really didn't pay you anything at all, whereas this could actually make you some quite nice arbitrages. Uh, well, of course, so did sulfur. Um, and then on uh, about 20, early 2030s, we start to see a few nuclear ships coming in. These will be in the big end of the market, uh, probably uh, the, the big container ships, um, the big bulk carriers, maybe the big tankers. And th that's how it all rolls out. Let me just then show you the same data, but from um, a fleet point of view. This is the fleet scenario, which results from that um, chart that I just showed you. And I think it sort of gives us a nice course towards zero carbon, because um, the first part here, this is heavy fuel oil. This is the old existing fleet. Um, some of this will be absorbed by carbon capture. And if, it's, if carbon capture is really successful, that could grow quite a lot and maybe shrink uh, this area uh, quite substantially, um, especially for older ships, you know, because uh, they, they've got little capital tied up in them. They can afford to slow steam. If you slow steam, not only do you save a lot of money on bunkers, but you don't produce nearly so much carbon dioxide to capture. So the whole thing becomes much more manageable. And uh, so I like the look of that. And then here come the green fuels, which builds up steadily from, well, it's happening already. And perched on the top is um, the, the nuclear energy, uh, which is creeping up. It's when you start running the numbers, it's quite difficult to do a bigger scenario than that. You know, and that's the, you know, the, getting the run out of these two is quite tricky. Um, and I hope you'll see that this whole thing is it's really a thinking it through process. It's not it's not really uh, trying to make a, a, a prediction or even a specific scenario. It's showing marginal competition between all these sources of green energy. And of course, this leaves us in 2050 with a bunch of LNG ships, which are puffing out carbon dioxide, which of course is um, not in line with the latest edict from IMO. And so maybe, but I, I would guess by the time you get up to here, ways will have been found to deal with this. Maybe it's more green fuels. Uh, maybe nuclear will go faster on the big ships. Uh, maybe carbon capture will turn out to be highly successful and you can, you know, in a few years, you're rolling it out at a rate of knots. It's, you know, it's, it's that sort of technology. And so that, that, that sort of gives you an idea, right? So, uh, and so I want to finish off for the last five or 10 minutes by running through some case studies from the past, because, you know, these are, I'm showing you statistics. I ran them out on a model, but these things, people make, these things have to be made to work. If there's one history from all the, one, one message from crawling over all the maritime history, which I do a lot of, it's my great weakness. Um, I love it, it's, <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, but, you know, it, there's always somebody lurking in the background who makes it work. And um, so I, I put in a, a few of these um, case studies, I won't spend long on them. I'm not even going to go through the slides which have a bit of text, but you might like to look at them later when they're posted. Um, the first uh, modern bulk carrier in 1852 was built for a very good reason to fight off competition from the railways. Um, Charles Palmer, who was a highly respected shipbuilder on the time, um, was also an investor in, in coal mines. And he was shipping his coal down to Newcastle, for, from Newcastle to London in Colliers. And it, it was obvious to him, I think, that um, they were gonna get wiped out by the railways if they weren't careful. I mean, you can see the chart here. Um, this is transport by sea, and that is, and it was growing, and then the, the railways pinch all the growth. And um, so he built the John Bowes, which um, 
uh, was a very innovative ship. It, as you can see, it, it didn't. It had a, 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 a screw propeller. It had a sixty-foot hold uh, for easy loading. It still had three um, uh, three masts. It there were two uh, engines with a single shaft, and um, the great thing was that it, it had water ballast in the double bottom and it pumped it out by steam power. Whereas in the old days, before that, you had to carry rocks, which you then had to offload manually and sell them and such, pay somebody to dispose of them. I think you can see them all piled up along the, uh, the River Tyne. Um, and so this ship was very, very innovative. Uh, he he built it and never never really looked back for, for what it's worth um this the, the john bows actually eventually founded under the spanish flag in 1933 it lasted a, um what was that uh 81 years can you believe it so you know this was a great piece of in innovation managed by a very um hands-on shipbuilder with interests um uh, and a di completely different sort of thing was the bulk shipping bo um, revolution in the 1950s, when the world was moving to global free trade. The multinationals were busy digging up uh, raw materials all over the world and uh, developing oil to replace coal. And they needed cheap, vast quantities of cheap transport very quickly. You can see the little graph at the bottom shows the growth of oil. And um, the, the, the whole role of, of a whole a, a role of new shipping entrepreneurs of whom YK so YK Power was a, a wonderful example, um, managed this by um, getting together with charterers, builders, banks, and managing the the whole thing um, in a way which allowed them to take the, 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 the to, to take the financing of this new revolution off their hands and support the shipbuilders and in fact what uh, what happened with Sir Y K Powell was that I think he ordered his first ship which wasn't a bulk uh, not new in. Um, uh, 1954 and he very rapidly he had good friends in the banking industry he worked very closely with the to build a good relationship with the Japanese the Japanese were very keen to to open new shipyards and to refurbish existing shipyards and um, uh, YK Power was able to offer um, very favorable time charters because he could borrow money cheaply from a commercial bank it, uh, against the backing of a time charter and uh, he managed to persuade the 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 uh, Japanese Zabatsu to give him those charters before the ship was built and um, once that was done uh, he, he, he was able to run them with international crews, which were a lot cheaper than the Japanese crews. So the whole thing worked perfectly. And Greeks like Anassis, Niarchos, many others in Europe were doing exactly the same thing, riding the back of the Euro dollar zone. And so that was a complete new generation of shipping investors. And they were new because it, most of the people who had the capacity to deal with all these stakeholders um, were actually newcomers to the business, or at least they were not the sort of big established companies. Talking about the big established companies, we come to containerization, which is a wonderful example. I mean, Malcolm McLean kick-started. Um, he was the entrepreneur who kick-started it. That, I reread that wonderful book, The Box, very recently, which and I have to say... <laughs> I felt tired just reading about it. He was he was a massively uh, energetic man. He got the idea apparently in 1937 when he watched a cargo liner laboriously loading cargo from a stream of uh, lorries and thought there must be a better way. Um, it took him. He, he he sold his lorries, bought a fleet of old tankers, and he did all the hands-on work. Um, he had to build a new organization, hire technical people, uh, develop cranes, um, test containers, figure out how much um, room you could leave 
in the cell guides if, so that the containers could be dropped in easily. Uh, and he, he managed by walking around, as Tom Peters says, he was a very, very hands-on man. And it wasn't easy. I mean, you know, he was his businesses didn't make money from the beginning at all. He had lots of difficulties. He started, uh, developed it in the US coastal trades. And then after 12 years, he managed to put the, um, the North Atlantic trade to work and he proved the concept. Well, containerization, which was a very disruptive technology, there's no doubt about that. I mean, it's, it's a king size disruption if you containerize. And um, the complex global roller, rollout of container services was followed up by the existing liner companies who did it with great difficulty. I mean, they their problem was they had big fleets of general cargo ships. Um, they watched, uh, they were facing massively increasing um, port handling costs, unsustainable. You can see in this little table that between 1960 and 1980, so 1975, the cost of moving a ton of cargo through the port of London increased from uh, three quarters from um, 0.75 pounds to 8.3 pounds. And the ships were spending half their life sitting in port waiting. That what happened in a nutshell was that the existing UK companies, four of them got together. Uh, they watched what um, McLean was doing. And this is not a very good summary, but it's roughly what happened. Uh, they finally, in 1965, realized that they had no choice there to do something. So they set up a new company, OCL, which they passed the, the, the Australia trade uh, cargo to. And that was run there for, there for, uh, forward as the container operation for those companies. Uh, none of them survived all that long. In fact, when I was at Chase, the well, Ocean Transport, which was perhaps the greatest of the four, um, was um, uh, they sold their last ship in 1990, a half share in the Barber Hector. So it was a very traumatic business and very difficult to manage. The, um, there is, however, another part to this story, which I think is interesting and is told very well in uh, Chris Tiffer Jefson's book, um, Creating Global Opportunities, which he wrote for Maersk uh, in 2014. Another absolutely fascinating book. And I'm not sure if I'm summarizing it correctly, and I'm sure someone from Maersk will ring me up and tell me off if I'm not. But my understanding is that um, when containerization was getting was going in 1966, Mr. Moller um, took a look at it and he commissioned consultants. He got a, a study, I think it was from Stanford Research Institute. Um, and then he got in um, uh, McKinsey and he developed a goal to, he, they, he decided, he took the decision, they couldn't do it yet. The others were starting, but he reckoned it was going to take 10 years to build the business to do it properly. And so he sort of piggybacked on pallets to learn some of the principles. He put to, he divisionalized the business so that he was able to sort of deal with the funding issues and, and capture the liner business in a separate business uh, segment. Um, he um, set up um, a, a leadership group very early on and the whole thing moved forward with the leadership group and containerization didn't progress until they all agreed it was inevitable and must be done. And then um, he did an enormous amount of detailed work going around ports, looking at how you could get at precise timekeeping, getting scheduling, sales, marketing, all that sort of thing. And he kickstarted the business 10 years later in 1975. So it took Mr. Moller as long to fine tune the business model as it took um, Mr. McLean to actually prove that the concept worked. And that really the fact that Maersk is the biggest, uh, well, it's, it's such a big container company today is seems to me an enormous tread, 
tributes to Mr. Moller's skills as a gifted thinker and his capacity to manage that whole process so effectively. Um, so my conclusions, as usual, I'm a little bit over, but never mind. Um, well, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> you you know what um, economists are like, we can't stop them. Um, however smart we are with technology, the cost of carrying cargo, which may reach 15 billion tonnes in 2050, will be much more expensive than it was with fossil fuels. So you've got to tighten your belt and, and swallow that one. Heavy fuel oil will be phased out in favor of greener fuels and nuclear power eventually. But I, my, my modeling sort of convinced me that carbon capture um, can really do a very good job of filling that gap until the whole technology and operations for, for, for green fuel and nuclear shake down. And so I'm going to have another look at the technology, but I intuitively I can't see the, the problem with that. Nuclear may be a promising option with plenty of time to get used to it. It's not going to happen for shipping companies tomorrow. But anybody who's seriously interested, bearing in mind the 10-year time scale, which I believe applies to every project and it certainly applied to Mr. McLean and Mr. Moller. Um, then, you know, if you want to be a player in 20 in 2035, you need to get started pretty quickly. Um, and um, overall, it's it's not a bad scenario for shipping. It, a lot of it is evolutionary. I mean, if you compare it with that nightmare of containerization which I took you through, and I do apologize to anyone in the container business if I didn't do them justice, but I, I did my best, and it's a, it's a short presentation, um, and do tell me if I've got something wrong. Um, but the, there's far more choices to be made. You know, the last 20 years, ordering a ship wasn't too difficult. You ordered a slightly bigger one, um, and maybe took a little look at the, you know, some of the outfitting, but that was it. Now every decision is going to be, you know, a, a difficult one. And so leaving aside nuclear energy, not too disruptive, using an upgraded version of the existing business model, I think um, that the shipping companies, each shipping company needs to figure out how to do it and how to add value surfing this exciting new tsunami that lies ahead. And I really do think it's, it's going to be a good one. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to um, back, back so that you can see my, <laughs> my full frontal image again. And um, I, I guess uh, maybe we've got some, um, I'm going to have a look to see if I can find some Q and A's if there are any, and if not, uh, uh, either we pack in or, or I, I have a think about it. Let's have a look. Uh, okay. Here's the first one. It's a long one. Dr. Stopford, you talked about the new energies and the timing of supply that could be applicable, uh, sorry, applicable in the market. One of the alternatives was nuclear power. Having IMO targets for zero emissions till 2050. What could be the case if some ship owners invest in alternative fuels which will not be suitable? Do they have still time to think about inv other investment decisions? Will they have the possibility, cost efficiency, to change the fuel type later? Well, I, I mean, I guess this is uh, uh, Demetrius. Thank you. <laughs> Great. I mean, perfect, uh, perfect question. Uh, I, I've tried to suggest, and I, or I came to the conclusion thinking about exactly this question that the the technology is quite flexible, and um, you know, we just we saw how the John Bowes last to, lasted eighty years. Believe me, it wasn't on the same engine when it finished. It was re-engined several times. And so was the first diesel ship, you know, this, um, this, uh, that was re-engined three times during its life. So I think that we have to expect to be adaptive. Uh, good, good new buildings will have as much 
um, built in as possible. Uh, I'm very, very interested to see how the carbon capture will work, because I think that in a way is, I mean, maybe my, the, the CEO who spoke, maybe he wasn't right. Maybe it could be a silver bullet. Um, who knows? So I think the answer to that is that, um, that, that it should be fairly manageable. And the, the, the shortage of green fuels will probably keep quite a bit of pressure uh, so that whoever invests in any alternative sort of whether it's carbon capture or green fuel consumption will get will be able to adjust it later uh, that, that that's that's the answer to that question I, well it's not a very good answer but i, I hope I hope it, it fills um uh, the gap here's um uh, from nimal um if CCS becomes commercially viable, do you expect other propulsion modes to become mainstream or will, or, or with CCS, are we going to see hydrocarbon based propulsion continue? Well, it's a great question. I mean, I, I had a call a few, about six months ago from um, a, small, a startup in Silicon Valley, which was looking at condensing um, CCS and from what they said, it sounded, um, you know, given the early stage, it sounded like it might they might be able to do something. I was, I'm afraid, I was a bit skeptical at the time. I mean, let's face it, you go through something like this, and you don't always, um, you you have to change your mind sometimes. And I've gone from being very skeptical to having a very very open mind about the CCS. And I, I, I don't think, in the end, it's a permanent solution. Um, Although you never know, I mean, if 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 the technology really worked, and um, then then it could be, you know. It, but um, I I think that the scenario I went through all of this, and what I showed you in my um, fleet scenario was the best I could manage by fiddling around with the numbers and thinking about what faced the shipping companies at each stage. So that's that's sort of where I got to on that. Um, here, Robert, um, you didn't specific, specifically mention biofuels, biodiesel and biomethane. Won't these be important in transitional years? Um, Robert, yes, you're dead right. I didn't. Um, I, I find it hard to take biofuels very seriously. I mean, as an ex-farmer, it was a it was a real pain in the neck the last few years because you couldn't get straw for the cows. They, you know, the 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 big farmers had sold it all to power stations to burn, you know. There is, and I remember seeing a map being shown of biomass in Europe, um, and there was lots of it. Uh, but it's all stuff that needs to go back into the soil. Um, there is a lot of biomass in India, which um is is being burnt at the moment uh, very so you know i think that's one area of great opportunity and there is a there's a company in japan that's exploiting that i just the name just escapes me at the moment but they're looking very hard at that and uh, so i th i think perhaps again i perhaps slightly underestimated biofuels but we agriculture is going to be under pressure you know that's the lesson from um well, not just from Ukraine. It's the lesson from a world population that's heading for 10 billion um, and um, climate change, which is not necessarily increasing our agricultural capability. So I I, I wouldn't rely too much on uh, biomass, but I'm open to discuss it. You know, I mean, it's it's like all these things. You've got to take each um, each step at a time. Um, uh, Peter, um, uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, there is great skepticism that the IMO 2040 and 2050 regulations will be ultimately enforced if the maritime industry cannot or will not produce enough new vessels. If su In such a scenario, do you think IMO regs will be relaxed or enforced? Well, Peter, I, you know, uh, you can... You can slag off computer models, but I've I've just I'm fresh. If I look as I'm sweating, I, I'm fresh from uh, the, you know two or three days sweating through this enormous model, and I it it doesn't include everything, but it takes a lot of stuff into account. 
And you know, when I did these slides, pulled these slides together and thought what I was going to say today, I think the scenario is marginal, is, is manageable. I think the industry will build enough ships. I, I really like the carbon capture thing. If only that can be made to work, it really takes a lot of the pressure out. Uh, and then, um, you know, the, 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 the chemical, the green chemical fuels are just, you know, they're, they're just a variant on heavy fuel. Oil. They're not as good, but they're okay. Um, and the shipbuilding industry has plenty of time to build those ships by 2050. So I, I think we can do it. And I, I would say the, the purpose of, a, of, of my sort of doing this stuff is to see if I can't come up with a convincing case that it is not only doable, but very manageably doable by companies that have the sort of um, intellectual and uh, uh, technical resource capability of the big companies like Stena and uh, um, uh, uh, TK. And, you know, there's lots of big companies looking and investing. And I think now's a time to be investing, especially, in, you know, I thought I, you know, I quite like, I've not, now I've done this, I quite like the look of this startup in, uh, in California on CCS, I don't know, because that has a big shipping investor. So I, I, I don't think you should be too pessimistic. I think it would be a real failure if the shipping industry has to be dragged through uh, decarbonization by IMO. I, I worked for a nationalized industry for 12 years and I'm not a great believer in that sort of thing. Um, Robert Tag, uh, uh, I've done bi biofuels. Um, I've, Robert, I've done yours. Um, uh, Kishore, um, can costly nature of green fuels deter their greater use and compel people to use fossil fuels? Um, I agree with the first part of that. Um, and I don't really agree with the compelling element. I think what, what I was trying to argue in the second webinar is that the the, the, the costs are going to go up for everything, uh, fossil fuels and non-fossil fuels, and costs drive change. I mean, you, you saw in my little case study what drove containerization by the big companies. You know, it wasn't really the boards. It was the fact they couldn't, it was getting so expensive to put their cargo through the ports. They had no choice. By 1965, you, you just couldn't run the business. And I think the same thing will happen, you know, that the fossil fuels um, and the cost of oil um, will both go up and that will provide the incentive to develop and spend good money on all of these technologies. That, 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 that's the way it looks to me. But, you know, that, 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 that's, that, that's today, maybe, who knows? But I, that, that, that's my view. How, how uh, the, Faisal, um, how come you didn't talk about oil tankers and the first one being in 1878 in Baku, <laughs> Azerbaijan? Well, okay. Uh, well, you can't talk about it. I get worried if I do more than half an hour because it, um, it's asking too much of you guys. But uh, I would have loved to have done uh, Baku. And I loved that. That, that, was, that was a wonderful oil tanker, you know, because they, um, they did it, the Suez Canal had just opened. And they did the outward voyage with oil, and then they cleaned out the holds and um, filled the uh, the holds with general cargo and took it back again. You know, so they got they, they got cargo both ways. And actually, interestingly, it didn't the oil didn't turn out that well as I as I recall because they did it. It was case oil. They did it in cans, um, and uh, or they they tried to begin with. They tried to do it in bulk, but the the I think Standard Oil was selling it already selling oil in cans and the cans um, were much more attractive in India than the oil and so you know they bought the oil for the cans if you know what I mean <laughs> and so um, uh, when uh, I think it was the four uh, the, the first cargo ship um, turned up with uh, from Baku with oil in bulk. Um, it, uh, it it was not um, uh, it was not a great success. I think they had problems distributing it for what it's worth. Uh, that's a lot of useless information, isn't it? Um, uh, oh, thanks, Nima. That's a nice uh, Andrew Coggins. Hi there. Um, do we have the schools to train people for the new technology? 
No, absolutely not. Um, I, uh, I, I have been trying to persuade um, uh, the universities I work with to set up courses in um, sort of combine economics and technical courses, finance, economics, finance and technology courses for quite a few years now to begin with for the digital technology. And I would say we are desperately short. I mean, the thing that worries me most is that half of the 26,000 shipping companies only have one ship. <laughs> I mean, proper companies. And, um, the, you know, the average company only has seven and a half ships. And it's, uh, there's no, uh, and the, in bulk, the rule of thumb is one, two people in the office for every ship at sea. We, we're going to have to think hard about that business model. So I completely agree we haven't. And uh, it's funny that people will spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a ship, but they won't spend a few million dollars on a trading academy. And that has to change. I mean, it has to change, you know, because the, the cargo owners are not going to work with companies who aren't articulate and haven't got staff that can interface with them at the technical level that the cargo companies can. I mean, I've worked with the oil companies for years and <laughs> I think the thing, the most astonishing thing is how sophisticated, the enormous lengths they grow to, go to to squeeze a bit more cash out of their um, suppliers. You know, it's the um, it, it's not an emotional business. Um, uh, is there a danger of captured carbon leaking back into the atmosphere if stored incorrectly or sabotage. Yeah, I guess so. To be to be to be absolutely honest, I haven't had a chance to go into the the disposal idea, but it did strike me that you know people seem to like methanol, and it would be quite a nice little loop if you took the the carbon back as uh, dry ice and then you took it to a methanol synthesis plant. Uh, near the near, near the bunkering station, and you synth synthesized with green the uh, car with green electricity there. So you'd you you'd be recycling. You know, for every uh, you lose some of it, it dilutes it a bit, but you would be recycling. Um, and it could, you know, of course, it could be lost back. But then, you know, no no rose without a thorn. Um, it, it, it potentially some would get through. Um, with highly expensive green fuels, is it likely that the cost of shipping transportation will be so high that trade may, trade may stagnate or reduce? Um, there's two, two parts to that answer. I think the, high, the increasing cost will shake up the cargo owners a bit. I mean, the cargo owners have got used to unbelievably cheap freight. I mean, you know, in money, uh, freights are still not much higher than they were 100 years ago. I checked that. And of course, I showed you that chart at the beginning. They've dropped enormously. Um, I think, you know, the one thing that big multinationals understand is cost. And if the costs start to go up and the cost of fuel gets passed on eventually, then it's going to change their behavior. It's going to bring them into a game, into the game much more proactively, possibly in much the same way they did, <clears throat> excuse me, the bulk shipping in the 1950s. That would be a very nice scenario if you brought the cargo owners in, um, just like the big oil companies and the steel mills came in in the 50s and 60s, and they worked together with the shipbuilders to come up with this sort of um, investment program which would um, spend the money needed on the new techno on, on the, the new ships with the sort of capabilities to, to use green fuel capture carbon and have nuclear engines you know um, <laughs> Thanks for the review on propulsion technologies. On another note, where are tanker rates going in the next three years? <laughs> Paul, <laughs> I uh, one of the reasons I started doing technology, and uh, I started in 2011 because I couldn't bear do, telling bulk carrier out another 10 years of telling bulk carrier out, you know, as the market was going to be terrible. I mean, you, you run out of jokes eventually. And I'm afraid um, I really don't know where the, um, the, 
the tanker freights are going. Um, but I've never seen such a, in all my lifetime, I've never seen such a small order book. So if I was a betting man, I think I'd put a few bob on the old tanker market. Um, well, there you go. Um, but, but that's um, that's just me. Um, oh, Matt, um, history of slow steaming. Uh, <laughs> well, um, of course, uh, th that's a good one. And this is the last question. So anybody who uh, who's fed up, I'm coming up to my hour anyway. Uh, slow steaming, of course, started with the, with the, the sailing ships. They you were lucky to get a to get an average rate of a knot with sailing ships. I've got I've got the noon log for one of the most efficient of the latest sailing ships, the Pamir. Uh, no, it was it was a, a Cecile, a Cecily. Um, oh, I've forgotten it. Um, uh, uh, a, a, a voyage from Australia to Falmouth, and it averaged seven knots. Sometimes it did seventeen knots. Sometimes it did no knots. You know. Um, the slow steaming, I think, started to develop very much um, uh, with, uh, or, or speed became an issue when when diesel engines came in, and um, because the diesel engines could go faster because they didn't need masses of people in the engine room who needed lots of coal, and so the ship speeded up because oil was cheap, mobile, easy to use. And uh, so, you know, that was a logic. Um, don't know about the 50s and 60s. The markets were so tight. There was not a lot of slow steaming in, in those days, I don't think. The first really big slow steaming came in 1977-78 um, after the great tanker boom, when you couldn't give away tankers. And um, there was, you know, we were heading for 100 VLCCs laid up. And that was the point at which ships started to go very slow indeed. Um, and that lasted um, for really until the price of oil went down in the mid 80s uh, and um, was a very big part of tanker economics. You know, in fact, the very first edition of my maritime economics had. Um, uh, a, a, an annex on slow steaming which I took out in the end it was full of matrix algebra and I decided to take that out <laughs> probably wisely um, and um, uh, after that it sort of um, as the price of oil has started to go up um, it's become much more of a variable and it is very interesting to me that um, uh, just checking the time, it's very interesting to me that, in fact, the, the the fleet is now trading, a lot of ships are now trading at today's oil prices about 11 knots. And in my optimized fuel optimization model, that's exactly where they should be. If you, you know, if you in the days of 20 of, of um, $200 a ton, um, you know, 200, um, uh, you know, 16 knots was absolutely fine. You go as fast as you liked. Um, at $500 a ton, my model says 11 knots is in on the on, is on the curve. And um, if you stick it up to $2,000 a ton, you know, um, speeds below 10 knots suddenly start to look very attractive indeed. Um, and it all costs money, you know. I know charters don't like, and it, it, the charters are going to foot the bill. So, and I, I do think an awful lot of cargo doesn't really need to move all that fast, as long as it's reliable. If you can get the digital, if you could get Amazon style deliveries at sea, you could go much slower because what, what business, all the surveys I've ever, I think nearly all the surveys I've ever read on logistics say, what the shippers say is if we can, as long as we know exactly when it's coming and we can check its progress, we don't really mind that much how long it takes. You can build your business around it. Um, and uh, that, you know, that I think is, is where we are today. And on that happy note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the questions. I've enjoyed them. It's exactly um, 1600 hours in the UK. and. Um, 
So I guess that uh, that, that, that makes it about 11 o'clock in New York. Uh, have, a, have a great day. And I do thank you all very much for joining in these webinars. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed them uh, as much as I have enjoyed preparing them. Uh, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm.